This is the Nielsen Norman Group UX Podcast. I'm Tim Neusesser, and I'm not Therese Fassenden, who's usually the host of this podcast and the person you might have expected. Therese is on maternity leave right now, and during this time, Samita Tankala and I, Tim Neusesser, will be your hosts of the NNG UX podcast. Therese, if you're listening, we send our warmest regards and eagerly await your return. In today's episode, we dive into a subject that's capturing the attention of many, artificial intelligence. We'll explore how AI is reshaping our personal and professional lives, the evolving impact it may have in the future, and how we can stay ahead of these changes. Additionally, we'll discuss the usability of AI tools and the journey towards making them universally accessible. To explore this topic, I spoke to two exceptional guests. First, we have Henry Modisad, the head of design at Perplexity AI. Henry brings a wealth of knowledge in AI, and he'll share valuable insights into the inner workings, the challenges, and aspirations of Perplexity AI. Our second guest is Kate Moran, the Vice President of Research and Content here at Nielsen Norman Group. She will offer a unique UX-centered perspective on AI. So without further ado, here are Henry and Kate. I think it's going to be really interesting to have like two different perspectives. Kate, she's here at NNG, right? We're more the researchers, maybe have a little bit broader perspective and try to kind of educate the whole UX industry about UI, and then you, Henry, really working on an AI tool and really designing an AI tool, so way more hands-on, and I think it's going to be really interesting yeah. to have these two perspectives meeting here today and discussing it, so maybe, Henry, you could kick us off and tell us a little bit about per uh, Perplexity AI, the tool that you're working on, and maybe what's your core mission there? Sure. Yeah, so Perplexity is... Uh... Uh, we, we've kind of tried to describe what it is a lot of times and it keeps changing. Um, but like the core purpose was to make a product that answered any question that you might have instantly. And so when, when we got this first version of perplexity working, it worked every time. And I was like, Oh, this is what I, this is this thing I've always wanted to have. And so we've been building just like functionality that we've wanted, that we wanted to use, that we thought might be useful and kind of built a mission around that, if that makes sense. So, you know, by all accounts, we did everything wrong. Um, but perplexity is supposed to be just the, the fastest way to get information. And what it's become is, I think, something even bigger than that, which is if you have all the information that's available in the world and you have yourself and you want to learn something, well, perplexity has become this bridge between you and that information. And, and not just like, you know, th there's a basic version of that, which is, you know, it, it finds summary, it finds um, uh, moments where, where like, where things like need to be kind of put together or, or pulled apart. Like maybe there's two viewpoints and it, and it will represent both of those things. It does all that, but it also can like act as a, as like a translator sometimes literally from one language to another, or sometimes from like, Hey, I'm, I have a PhD in math. Tell me about nuclear fission. Like I get, I, I understand a lot or I'm in middle school. Tell me about nuclear fission. I don't know anything. Uh, and it becomes this like magical bridge between like, you know, all information world that's been compressed and re, re uh, reorganized for you. So, sorry, it's a very long winded answer, but uh, it really, we really kind of did start by just, building something that seemed useful and then we shared it and then people started using it and then we built a company. That's awesome. You know, tools like perplexity kind of remind me of the early days of Google. So I was a nineties kid and a nerdy kid, <laughs> like kind of a techie kid. And I remember when Google first came out, it was so much better than like ask Jeeves. And I remember <laughs> this feeling of, uh, like, oh God, like I can learn anything, like anything I'm curious about, I can find it. 
But of course, with search, there's a lot of work in manual work involved with that information seeking process, like formulating your queries, evaluating the sources, scanning for the information. And it's really exciting. Again, like I kind of get that feeling over again with tools like Perplexity that are so shortcutting that information seeking process. It's really exciting. Yeah, Kate, kind of let's say an updated or upgraded version of Google, right? It's a mm -hmm. better tool to find information. Henry, like you said, not only finding the information, but sometimes also like processing it and translating it into something that it's maybe more ac uh, accessible for us, right? Um, what do you think makes perplexity different and maybe sets you up to be the Google of the future right? <laughs> that everybody is using? Because there's so many AI tools out there, right? How do you try to distinguish yourself from the other ones? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's like a, I could write like an essay on, on the answer to that, I guess. But I think in, you know, we didn't start the company to compete with Google um, or any search engine. And I think, I think if we had, that would have probably made us fail, right? We, we started by just trying to build things that would be useful for us. And then we shared it and then learned what would be useful for more people. And then kind of like kept walking down that road and, until people were like, oh, actually, I can use this instead of other tools. Um, and that that's kind of like, I think, the only way. And, and but the cool thing is that we what what I have conviction about is that what is the best the best thing is to just get information as fast as possible. And, and that's been like a flag that we planted really early on in, in terms of the product design and the engineering principles right like it's just that is the most important thing is speed literally in how the technology works but also in in the user experience and that kind of has just being obsessed with that and being obsessed with information being delivered it to you like in a way that would even be cognitively fast to process um that just has differentiated us naturally and also like there's a lot of ways in which people do use google where it just immediately feels like a lot of work, like you said earlier. Um, and so there, the product kind of has become naturally that because of our, it feels funny to say like our niche, even though it's like the, one of the most human needs. Uh, so it's like a very universal niche of just wanting information. And, but, but, it but that's like, oh yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, but that, that is a niche though. If you compare it to something like chat GPT, yeah, which like, is. what is chat GPT a tool for? kind of whatever you can think of. Yeah. And like, we know that when tools are, you know, broader use like that, when there's kind of more ambiguity, it's often harder to design a satisfying experience. Absolutely. So Henry, like what role do you think having, even if it's big niche, <laughs> like having even a slight, slightly more narrowed niche has, has kind of played in perp perplexity success. Well, it's, it's, it makes the design a lot easier. Um, but it also, the, the hardest part was coming to that opinion and, and having the conviction to not like, I mean, it, it's really, it's a trap to fall into when you're building a startup and going zero to one to like, look at a competitor and then like make minor tweaks to it. It just never works. Uh, or, or if maybe it can, if your business is completely different, right? Your operations work different or something like that. But in t when you, when design, when product is going to be the way in which your business is differentiated. You kind of have to just like ignore your competitors, I think. Um, but the, it's all the details that change. And, and yeah, you said it right. Like OpenAI, um, they're building an amazing thing and, but they're building a different thing and they're building a platform that's going to have to work for all kinds of use cases that we're not thinking about. And, and I'm, I don't know, platforms are like one of the hardest, most complex design problems. Because you have to build systems that are meant to work in ways you don't even know. And you don't even know how people are going to use that. And therefore, it's really hard for um, any individual experience, uh, any, any individual like vertical use case to be great. So then for us, it's like the, just being very confident in that people want information as fast as possible and want to trust that information. Well, then it's like actually quite a simple design problem. And that's why you, the product kind of, in some sense, feels quite simple. There's the sources, and then there's an answer. And it's not a conversation. It just told you what you asked for, and that's it. And delivering on that 
and and providing multi uh, multi modalities of inf information. Right when you we'll, we'll show you text, we'll show you videos, we'll show you images, we'll show you maps. Uh, just trying to like give you instantly what you wanted and 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 represent that information in, in a variety of forms, and then it should feel kind of you know like it just works. And it seems like you were saying you really were focusing with the design on making this as easy as possible, right? Someone is seeking information and you want to make it super easy that they can access yeah. that information. And it seems like you've done a good job, right? I, I know you just got your Series B funding <laughs> with uh, 73 million. We have NVIDIA involved, Jeff Bezos, right? So it seems like it's it's recognized and you're moving somewhere. Um What do you think is maybe the next step with this funding? What does it set you up for? Where do you see Perplexity AI going with this? Um, how can you make it maybe even easier to find that information? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the, my strategy for making it easy at the beginning was, okay, this what's happening here is actually really complicated. Um, there's a search engine. There's all the AI stuff, multiple uses of it at different stages and but when you just try it, it 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 works and if you if you can just think of one thing and ask it you can see how the product is unique and so my goal is to just put very familiar looking ui on this new magical thing um and also just like i've i've worked on consumer products my whole career and i and i kind of know how hard it is to get people to kind of do anything and so I, I think like the most successful UI design is it has sort of like a gravitational pull. You, you look at it, you squint, kind of like hit the brightest thing on the screen, and just if hopefully that aligns with what the product's supposed to do, and then people can just kind of like tumble through it. I think that's the best you can do for consumer design. Like people just have no, especially a free product. You've got like 300 milliseconds of someone's attention before they don't decide that they don't get it or that it sucks or whatever. Uh, so anyways, that, that has been like the most important, I don't know, you like mindset, I think, and being humble, just being humble about that. And, um, but yeah, we've, we've found a lot of traction, which is, um, obviously very amazing. And, and I think it's been cool because I, we just had all this conviction about what the product, how the product should be, and then using it ourselves, finding, finding it useful. And then it's just really like a, how do we tell more people about it type of problem, which is, mm -hmm. A, a fun place to be in because that's great. Then we just keep adding depth to the experience. And yeah. Whenever I'm talking to people about um, the design of, of interfaces for these AI tools, um, I'm often pointing to spe specific things that y'all have done at Perplexity as, as good examples. And I think that focus on consumer applications yeah. and thinking about this being for like the general public has been a really big advantage for you because, you know, if you look at these tools are, they're trying to get better. I mean, we have like, you know, mid journey alpha coming out that looks like it'll have a, maybe a slightly yeah. friendlier UI, but like these were clearly tools that were made for nerds <laughs> like yeah. us who can figure it out, not made for, you know, my grandma to be able yeah, to, <laughs> to understand. Sure. Yeah, no, it's uh well, I mean, you have to remember that chat GPT was a, essentially like a tech demo for the models. Like it, it was never meant to be a consumer product. And what's amazing is it became the most successful consumer product launch of all time. Right. And that just speaks to how, how, you know, the novelty of, of this technology and, and uh, of LLMs and, and these models. Right. So yeah, I, nobody was really trying to make a consumer product like from the beginning. Uh, and the people, you know, uh, thank, thank God for all these amazing engineers who are just like willing to build something and, and share it and not worry about the UI because, you know, if you cared so much about that, you probably wouldn't have built any, no one would have built any of this stuff. Right. And, and I, I really believe in like being very scrappy with, especially with new stuff. Um, I, I love beautiful interfaces and I, I love being thoughtful. Um, but it can hold you back. Um, and we're in this like really fun phase of experimentation and sharing and, um, and not everyone's even trying to build a business, right? There's all this open source stuff. 
Uh, I think there's just an energy right now of moving quickly and and exploring and, and enjoying the the discovery of new things. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. You said you're kind of at that place in the journey where you have to get more people on the platform and they start using it, right? So now you kind of figured out the, the technical aspect, of course, not fully, but a big part of it. And now you kind of have to make it usable, right? Yeah. What are maybe some of the biggest challenges that you discovered there and that you see in the future as well? Yeah. Really make it usable for like everybody, right? Just like Google, almost everybody knows how to use it. But how do we get AI tools to a similar place where everybody all around the world can just go in there and like figure out how to get this information, how to yeah. translate it, like you said earlier, or maybe how to generate something by themselves? Why it's hard is we still have the early users, right? We still have people that deeply understand AI and they maybe use ChatGPT and us, or maybe they're like, even there's some even deeper tools, LLM playgrounds. And they're like, man, I really wish I could, you know, up the temperature on, on the model or whatever, or even switch the model or, or maybe show two outputs simultaneously. And, and it's really hard to be like, sorry, we're not really building that. Um, but then at the same time, I, I've done user research or talked to users and and uh, there are buttons on the screen. There's not that many and there's buttons on the screen that they don't even see, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, this is the, the, the major challenge of balancing at a basic level, like new user, power user spectrum. Um, we have that, which is like, I mean, a blessing to have the spectrum available to you, but it makes it hard. And it's so, really hard. yeah. And what, what, what's so cool, I guess, is so the dream the dream product the, the dream interface system that i've always wanted right that anyone probably wants as a designer is to be able to show everyone the right interface for them right like if you're a new user you kind of like get easy mode and then when you're a power user you somehow get power user mode whatever that is however that manifests and uh, the closest i've ever seen to this is maybe in video games But what's cool is I feel like we're probably going to get some of that pretty soon with how uh, even when our product, we have some generative interface moments um, where it like I, all I as the designer, all I defined was like, there will be you have like dear AI, you have the choice between text input, radio button, things like that. And you pick the right interface to show like we're giving it the choice to then present the right interface. I can totally imagine that is just like the beginning of a reality where like we can show people, we could kind of like let the interface unravel itself and the capabilities unravel itself as people use it. And it can be a, a truly personalized experience. That's like, so it sounds exciting. a little bit, it sounds like, yeah, on one hand, exciting, kind of terrifying to like yeah. <laughs> design for. Um, right. But I, I, I have to, I really believe that's going to be the best thing. The, the coolest thing, okay, on a, as a counterpoint, I was in the middle of nowhere in Canada, like six hours from a major city, wearing a perplexity sweater. And some, uh, a group of four, uh, people that are like my parents' age came up to me and they said, are you, hey, are you affiliated with perplexity? And I was like, what? Uh, and, and they're like, we, we, uh, and I say, well, yeah, I work there. And they're like, they were shocked to see me in this small ski town. And I was and I was shocked that they're talking to me about it. But they're like, we use it. We like that it's fast and simple. And I was like, okay, well, I'm done. I did it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's the you, that's you a great feeling. Yeah. What the heck? I, I, I can't believe it. So, anyways, so somebody's wanna, figuring it out. I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of generative um, interfaces because I've been yeah. kind of waiting to to see this appearing more in in our field and. Um, And it's really exciting to hear that you guys are already kind of working on that. Is that happening in the co-pilot feature? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for, for listeners who aren't as familiar with perplexity, one of the things I really like about perplexity that I think they're doing well is they have this co-pilot feature, which you can enable that if you submit an information request and it has clarification questions for you, it will ask those questions before it runs that prompt. And I think that's a great way to help people because we're seeing from the user research, you know, general side, 
we're seeing a lot of people really struggling to know how to use these things, how to write their questions. Um, so you get a little window that pops up that says, you know, uh, you know, you asked about um, building a DIY, building a sauna. And <laughs> are you talking about an infrared sauna or, a, you know, and so you can you can narrow your question that way. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? So like how how that generative UI is working there? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, one of our, I think, most interesting features and it has it's a very nascent concept but yeah the idea is that you you ask a question and then it what it it tries to figure out whether if maybe it would benefit you would benefit from more precision and it'll ask you questions back but what's cool is it like you can ask anything and then it's going to ask it's like it feels like it learns the subject of what you just asked and becomes an expert in like mill you know seconds and then produce, you know, like you said, you're like, Hey, I'm going to build a sauna. And it's like, okay, well, suddenly I'm a sauna expert. Do you want an infrared sauna or whatever? Um, and I, I, I'm always kind of surprised when I ask like something very niche, um, that it does that. But, but the other part of it is, so like I said, I mean, the core product principle is we, low cognitive load, uh, and typing sucks, especially on your phone. Like pe- why, why should people have to type so much? Uh-huh. And it's also not like the best way uh f- it's not, it's not the it's not necessary uh and it's also just not the best way to capture information all the time. It's not the most efficient interface so like for example, let's say I was trying to plan a trip or buy a plane ticket, and it's like trying to figure out where my what when a date picker is a great interface. Why would I type something um you know what I mean? So it's just there. There are plenty of things that are solved that we don't need to throw away. And so what Copilot does is it when it tries to figure out what you want and maybe help you get drilled down a little bit more. And it will use it has the ability to decide to use different interfaces uh, to more efficiently uh, extract information from you. So sometimes it'll radio inputs. So. Yeah, that is so cool. And it's just like <laughs> a small, a small step in that direction. But like, yeah, I, I'm really excited to see where as as you know, a UX and design field where we can take that, and like where where that ends up, like it does, as you said, opens up the ability to on the fly design interfaces that are better suited to the individual. And I'm thinking about something you mentioned earlier, Henry, that uh, perplexity can tailor the response based on your experience and your knowledge, which is not yeah. something I had, I had thought of or tested or ever realized about perplexity. So that's awesome. And that's another thing that makes me really excited for the future of information seeking. Yeah. Because that's always been a challenge we've seen in research where, you know, we have somebody who has a PhD in oceanography. He's right. searching for something. He's seeing a lot of stuff that's meant for middle schoolers. <laughs> so yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and I, I'm also thinking about like, these are some of the major challenges that UX and design has faced for as long as I have been in this field, yeah. uh, which is coming up on 15 years. And it's, it's exciting to think about a future where we can actually tailor the UI to individuals. Yeah. And I, I love what you said earlier there, Henry, you're kind of taking small pieces from everywhere, right? And Henry, you said, we see something in a video game, we take something from there. We see, we know radio buttons, so we know other right. UI elements, and you kind of just combine it and mix it together in a novel way on a new playing field, right? Yeah. But I think that's probably the best way to make new tools usable because then people are already familiar with it and already figured out, have used them hundreds of times. So they already know how to use it. And then it's just the kind of the mental model of your, your tool sure. they have to understand that, but they don't have to understand the UI like a hundred percent or they, they already know most of it. So they don't have to fully relearn it. Right. Absolutely. Um, but with that, yeah. how do you think it can further help people to actually understand like how to even get better in using these AI tools? Because I've always yeah. seen these like, long lists of how to write a prompt, how to write the best yeah, prompt yeah. for, I don't know, how to build a sauna, right? Or, or something else. 
And he said the first step is maybe having your AI platform already asking, like, can you give me yeah. some more information? But what's maybe the next step after that? Yeah, well, I think I kind of I kind of treat it as a normal consumer cold start type of problem. Um, I mean, with with prompting, I, I think prompting is like the worst software experience ever. Uh, I, I mean, if you've ever tried to generate images, it, it's it's awful as an experience, but it, the payoff's amazing, right? So people do it, but we're it's just that we're in a small blip of software experience where this is even going to be a thing. I, I just there's no way it survives. Like, well, we, actually, we have image generation on our product, but it's just a button. It's like you want it to look like an illustration, and you click that button, and then it it does. There's a lot of prompting. I spent hours of my life picking picking the prompts, <laughs> but I don't want users to have to do that. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I think to to make it intuitive, I, like I said, I, I kind of I take a consumer product approach, which is you want to you people need to feel somehow bought in to first you need to understand what this place is again you've got like milliseconds here um and then ideally you can look at some example content right away to 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 build that mental model and start to be modeled like the behavior of the platform uh so you know when you boot up tiktok for the first time you've never seen it heard of it it's pretty easy to figure out what it is and you don't learn how to make a tiktok by jumping right into the creation flow, you learn how to make tick TikTok by watching 20 TikToks. And maybe like when you get in there, there's a little bit of help with, I don't know, I've never done it, but I'm sure there's like some little pop-up maybe, but I, I don't think any of that actually works. Because when you watch people use software, they just click on stuff really fast. Nobody's reading anything. Mm-hmm. They're just trying stuff, mm-hmm. um, which I think is totally fine. Um, and so for us, like, I mean, if you go to our homepage when you're when you're logged out or making a new account, there's just like a couple things you could click on. Um, and you can type in, and it feels familiar. Hopefully, you can just type something. Maybe how you would use Google or ChatGPT. Um, but then there's a couple things you can click on that are examples, like, and it's like this dynamic thing and just questions. Maybe it's one of those. You're like, okay, I, I guess I'll see what that the answer to that one is, and then hopefully you get it because. There's a lot of things we could have put on the homepage that we didn't. There's a lot. It's all in the end, I think, distracting. I think my goal is just to get you to try it. And, mm-hmm. and I'm going to just keep thinking of ways to do that. And I think another consumer strategy is around like getting, making it feel like you've got some skin in the game or some kind of connection to it. Um, so maybe when you're signing up, you, you tell us about yourself or something or, or you, you fill out kind of some kind of profile that, that does work as well. Uh, so you feel like, all right, I've, I'm invested in this a little bit. I'm going to give it a couple extra minutes in my evaluation time because people balance if they don't get it really quickly, right? Um, that's just the nature yeah. of consumer. I love, so it. This, I love what you said. Well, Sorry, Kate. Oh, yeah, I have it good. right behind me here, right? Like, yeah. keep it to, <laughs> You said I have yeah. so many things I, I could add, but we really want to keep it to its core because it should be easy for people to learn. Um, Katie, yeah. your, your turn. So... um. I love this conversation because we're talking about mental models here. We've used this term a couple of times. I just want to define it for anybody listening who's not familiar sure, with this yeah, concept. Sorry. So we're, no, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our field is just chock full of jargon, which makes it so hard to, to get in here. Um, but so when we're talking about mental models, we're thinking about the, the way that the user understands how this tool functions and what it can do for them and how they're supposed to use it. So it's very much connected to like le- a lot of a lot of times what people are doing when they're forming new mental models is they're leveraging prior experience with similar yep. things. So, you know, Henry, you've already talked about how you're trying to leverage things from consumer apps that people have experiences with. So they kind of have a sense for how they're supposed to use it, which is best practice for UX. We are really interested and we're doing a lot of research on how people, especially people who are not us, who are not like techie, um, how they're experiencing these tools for the first time and how they're figuring out what they are. So I think a big advantage that Perplexity has over something like ChatGPT, kind of related to the narrowness, is that Perplexity can look like a search field 
because it does provide, you know, this is an understatement, but it does provide roughly a search function. So we've seen in like the diary studies we've done when when people are new to chat GPT, they'll try to type in like keywords because that's what oh, they're used yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that does not work <laughs> with chat GPT. Right. It has no idea what you're asking for. But with yeah. complexity, it can probably it can probably guess. And then with that co-pilot feature, there's even that hand holding to right. say like, tell me a little more about what you yeah. mean. Yeah, we we make this big assumption that you're trying to get information. And and that just like it like pulls people over the hump of like not knowing what it is to understanding what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, people, but people try to use it like chat GPT and it kind of fails. It's like, it's not really there to chat with you. Um, and it's not about okay. outputs. It's about yeah. information. How do you think these AI tools, they are changing everybody's life, right? What do you think is maybe a big difference in the future, how we live and how we work through these your, uh, AI tools? Yeah. Well, I kind of just think like everybody is going to be empowered um, by whatever they do. There, there will be something that like accelerates them. Um, whether it's if they're doing research, I mean, for us, it's really all about learning and research. And, and I'd like to think that that process is accelerated. And, and and also maybe there's new things, new behaviors that might open up that like you didn't even know you could do. Um, like the the one that, t- that we've built that is still kind of I'm still trying to wrap my head around is you can with on the on our app you can take a photo and that and have that be your question so I can take a photo of like I don't know like uh, there's a, I've seen people use it a bunch of ways but like I'll, you know take a photo of of my dog or something and I'll be like um what what's a good name for him. And like something like that and it like figures out that it's a dog and it figures out that he's a brown schnauzer and it's like what about coco you know and it's like oh my god you know there, there's you stuff that like dog? no i didn't i named him rupert but uh That's also a great name yeah uh but you know it's like there, and i've seen people take um a photo of the, the whiteboard and interface and then they'll take a photo and they'll be like what's the write some code that makes this um, so there's a lot of things that like, I don't even, we will definitely, we are definitely doing a lot of, let's just build it and see what happens kind of mindset, uh, no. less about like some vision for the future of anything. It's just more like, I don't know, this, this could be useful. Maybe, I don't know. There's a combination of stuff where I'm like, this is definitely useful. And then another, another set where I'm like, I have no idea what to do with this, but somebody will come up with some ways and that's the cool coolest part about building a a tool you don't have to think through every use case Uh, which is like the polar opposite of how ux used to work (laughs) right yeah (laughs) um yeah that is that is really exciting and i you know i'm thinking back to something you said at the beginning of this chat henry where you're like well we started with this purpose and then that kind of became something else and we just keep you know redefining ourselves and uh you know talking about how you're using generative interfaces. Um, I think this this technology, the pace of it, d- this development is just so beyond anything we've seen before yeah. that as a company, as an AI company, you probably are going to have to keep redefining yourself as you know things change. And that's For such sure. an exciting place to work and like kind of context to be in. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been through this already multiple times. And I mean, to be clear, we've only really been a product for a year. Um, and we built a lot. And, and if we have a, a strength as a team, it's our agility and, you know, kind of our open mindedness to, OK, well, let's try this and build it fast. And, you know, I, I care a lot about craft. And so I'm going to I'm going to execute on it as, to the best of my abilities. Um, but, yeah, it's there's like the the image thing you know we we find out that it's a capability and we're like what should we do with this um how is it going to work in our product um could it does it make sense in our product because there's some stuff that doesn't and we won't we have to have some kind of you know idea of who we are and what we're what we want to be great at but um yeah i mean i i expect the, the market there there's the technology there's the market they're all nuts um, you know, th- there's a massive, massive competition happening with billions of dollars. And we're just kind of like in the room. Um, 
trying to make a useful product, uh, which is, um, I don't know, it's a nice kind of clarity about who we are. Um, and you know, on our, on our product, you can, if you pay for our pro version, you can, you can use open AI's models, you can use, um, Anthropics. You, um, so we're, we are, we are really more focused on just building something for that's like a product and a brand. And something that people want to use and, and, and building a, just like the way you would build a normal consumer product company. Um, so I think if we were, if I, if we were trying to compete uh, head on with, you know, the, these massive AI research teams, like, I don't, it would be much more stressful. I, I think that's your competitive advantage in a lot of ways, because like we saw after chat GPT exploded in a way that nobody predicted we saw all these companies suddenly rushing like, ah, we've got to get <laughs> AI. And there's a lot of like copying going on between the competitors. And so people aren't really coming up with anything that's innovative or different. And I think that's part of why complexity stands out. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's actually wild, the development we've seen in the last, I don't know, 12, <laughs> maybe 15 months, right? Yeah. Okay, what, what do you think is maybe our role as NNG in there, right? Because we've never seen it change so fast in these tools and now everybody's using and the world is changing really fast for all these designers, but also for all the consumers as well. So what's our yeah. role in this? To be honest, it's been kind of chaotic. You know, <laughs> usually like NNG, we kind of pride ourselves on being sort of like a pseudo, like a bridge between a kind of academic style research and practical right. style research. And we try to be a voice of reason as much as we can. And kind of anytime there's new hype around something, we try to be measured with our approach and, and right. you know, not make kind of like sensationalist claims. And I think we're still we're still trying to play that role, and we we are playing that role, and we're trying to help people. Um, you know, something that that Caleb Sponheim, one of our our coworkers at NNG, um, who's actually creating uh, an, our first AI course right now, something oh. that he he said to me is, you know, there's a lot of noise about what AI is going to mean for UX, and there's not a lot of signal. There's <laughs> there's yeah. all these prompt <laughs> guides. There's all these like sweeping statements like. You know, just like that, oh, this is going to change everything. And I'm guilty of, you know, getting overexcited at times about that kind of stuff. But we're really trying to move as quickly as we can, but also make sure that we're giving people practical advice that's actually based on reason and, and what right. we have in front of us. I think that the thing I feel confident in is that not everything should be a chat. Yes, actually, most insane. products, <laughs> most products should not be a chat. And most no. products, I think this is another take is that most products don't benefit from having like an anthropomorphized AI concept. Mm -hmm. Like this technology, there's a lot of, there's actually this tech AI, right? There's a lot of things happening. There's the, the generative images, videos, sound. There's that, there's the LMs. It's just going to be available every in everything and in everywhere it's it it'll be kind of just like an, a way to enable some core product experience it's automation yeah yeah mm -hmm. and 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 it'll make some new software that that's amazing and it'll make some old software and just like accelerate it and mm -hmm. yeah i agree with that yeah definitely not everything needs to be a chat we're seeing like a lot of you know these poor executives at these companies are being told like you have to put ai into this product so they're like a chat because that's that's kind of like the example that's held up before them yeah but i definitely agree henry that like the anthropomorphizing is not necessary in every context and i actually have an example kind of a linkedin debate that i've been in this week is around <laughs> Uh, the concept of synthetic users, there's actually a company with that name, but there's this debate, you know, do we need to have user research if we can have AI pretending to be people mm. <laughs> giving us feedback as if they're human? And what I'm kind of stuck on is, first of all, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, and second of all, why do they have to be synthetic users? Why can't it be, uh, you know, why can't you train a model on on how experts evaluate systems based on heuristics and like proven best practices and then present it that way. Why do you have to pretend yeah. like it's a, a mom in Georgia giving <laughs> you know, like, her feedback? Yeah, because there's an uncanny valley no matter what. Right. right.
Yeah. And the danger there, I think, is like, and I also think like this is kind of causing some collective, like, not delusion, but there's there's some moral panic happening uh, in society as a whole. And there's yeah. a lot of fear that like these things are going to replace us in various ways. And I think the the fact that we're putting human faces on a lot of these things is yeah. definitely contributing to that. Yeah, may Maybe to wrap it up here, let me build on that. What you just said, Kate, there's a lot of hype around it, right? And a lot of people are afraid. And I think part of it is what you said earlier, Henry. We make people, or especially you and all the AI tools, make people a lot faster. There's a lot of automation, right? So the world is changing in itself, and the way we work is also changing. What is maybe something that people out there can do to not be left behind, right? Because I think that's a big part of this fear. Yeah. It's like, wow, everything is changing. Like, what's going to happen with me in a few years, in five years, or in 10 years? Right for Kate and Henry, what what is something that people out there can maybe do to like work against this fear? That's an interesting question. I because I I guess I kind of feel like the I kind of feel like because I'm on the other side, right? I feel maybe more like if we don't make software that's useful, all this technology goes to waste, and because I, I feel like the market will vote on us on, on anybody. Um, and so it's not, I, I kind of don't see it as like people need to learn stuff. I see it more as like software creators need to make some stuff that's useful and, and fit it into people's lives. It's like on us to present it and to grow it. And like people, I don't think people are going to change that much. Um, it, there's always, there's always people that are willing to try new stuff. There's always like an appetite. There's always a long tail of people that eventually catch up. Um, so. But I mean, obviously, like everyone should, I mean, this is like maybe general advice, just be o open sure. to trying stuff. But I don't know, like as someone who makes software, you've got, we've got the whole world that we need to talk, tell about our thing that we've made. And uh, it, we, we're never going to be successful if we ask anybody to change who they are and how they feel about software. Um, so it's more like, how do we tell the story about how useful it is? I love that, Henry. Um, and I agree with that, that, you know, just just try it. Don't don't freak out. Don't be afraid <laughs> of it. Just try it. I think that's really important because we see that over time, individuals who are afraid of, of new products and don't at least try them and kind of form these mental models around them. Those are the people that get left behind and they they don't they're afraid of using technology. They don't understand it. So, for example, my my grandmother, um, yeah. she worked. Um, she retired kind of later in life and she worked in advertising where over time she had to learn how to design things on yeah. a computer and use the internet. And eventually she started coding HTML because she was just curious <laughs> about it. And now she yeah. runs her garden club website, which is that's amazing. Cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, she's so um, I, I think that's a good example of like, you don't have to keep up with the pace at which things are changing unless it's your job or it's something that you're interested in, in which case it's really fun to follow, I find. But you you should use this, you know, to keep up kind of, but also just because they're good tools that make your life easier. For sure. <laughs> so I have a great example of this. I was just visiting a friend in San Diego who is a biologist. She's a researcher and she's studying measles. And she was telling me one of my the things I have to do as part of my job is keep up to date on, on recent research on measles. But it's really hard to find the time to find these research papers and read them. And I was like, yeah, why aren't you using perplexity? <laughs> <laughs> like, I pulled it up. I, like, did, I was like, um, well, summarize the recent research on measles and like showed yeah. it to her. I was like, this could be like saving you so much time, making you better yeah. at your job, making your life less stressful. Well, Henry, Kate. Thank you for, uh, so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think I'm even more excited for the future of <laughs> AI, more excited for the intersection of AI and user experience, and hopefully talk soon. Thank Thanks, you for Henry. having me. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> that was Henry Modisette and Kate Moran. Check the show notes for links to anything we've referenced so far, but also Remember that we have thousands of articles, videos, and reports on our website about UX design, research, strategy, and even UX careers. 
That website is www.nngroup.com. That is nngroup.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, please follow or subscribe on your podcast platform of choice and share your thoughts with us on social media. This episode was hosted and produced by me, Tim Neusesser. All video editing and post-production is by the Larry Moore Production Company. That's it for today's show. Until next time. And remember, keep it simple.